Welcome back. Today we will talk about addition reactions. Let's start by defining what addition reactions are. When you have an alkene or even an alkyne starting material, each one of these organic reagents has a region of high electron density, namely the area where the multiple bond is located. And if you mix this reagent with another one that is prone to attracting electrons, then you can have a reaction happening. In essence, the multiple bonded molecule acts as a nucleophile and the second reagent behaves as the electrophile, the one that wants the electrons. And what you end up forming is something known as the addition product, specifically the two elements that made up this weak bond end up now becoming elements bound to the carbons that used to be part of that multiple bond. Notice that now the multiple bond is not there because you are trading the double bond for a new single bond to this um, atom E. So a few things that probably need to be reminded is that we do have um, homo orbitals for double bonded molecules, in particular, uh, pi bonds, which are two p orbitals in phase with each other. And then you have lumo orbitals, like the one right here between an electronegative element and one of lesser electronegativity, creating an antibonding orbital with a lumo orbital that, if of the same phase as the orbitals here for your homo, you create a bonding interaction between them. And so your alkene and alkyne functionalities are capable of attacking diatomic molecules like dichlorine, dibromine, diiodine, uh, substances that have weak bonds in essence, uh, but also can attack substances that contain hydrogen heteroatom bonds, in particular the strong acids, the hydrohalic acids, um, and a few weak acids as well under certain conditions. And much like the homonuclear diatomic molecules, you could have heteronuclear diatomic molecules uh, reacting in much the same manner. All right, so your alkenes and alkynes are gonna behave as the nucleophiles, the things that provide the electrons. And any of these molecules, which are pretty reactive on their own, um, are regarded as the Lewis acids or electrophiles, the substances that will be acquiring the electrons. Okay, so let's talk about um, the addition reaction onto alkenes with some of these diatomic molecules. And as I said, we're expecting to make that addition product, but we're gonna dwell deeper into how that happens. All right, so the first thing about this process is that when the reactions were first performed, a few centuries ago, um, one of the scientists involved, Markovnikov, a Russian scientist, he noticed that whenever the alkenes were treated with the electrophilic substance um, right there, specifically a heteronuclear substance, the element that was the least electronegative ended up being bound to the carbon that had the most H's. And yes, this is a picture of Markovnikov right here, you know, just uh, judging, judging my lectures. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so the least, what he did notice is that the least electronegative group did bind to the carbon that had the most H's. And that's to say that on this alkene, the carbon of the alkene on the left side only has one hydrogen bound to it, but the carbon of the alkene on the right side has two hydrogens bound to it. So Assuming that E is the least electronegative element between these two, E will end up being bound to the carbon on the right side, which is the one that has the most H's. And X will then bind to the carbon on the left side. All right, so that was the observation. Now, many years later, probably decades later, um, the reason that this observation was taking place and that it was basically happening when the alkenes were reacting with these electrophiles in that specific manner was because in order to carry out the mechanism to get to the product side, you have to go through two steps. The first step involves the alkene attacking that electrophilic element. In the process, the 
bond right here is broken, the electrons go to the more electronegative element. But when this takes place, you have basically used up two of those electrons of the pi bond to make a new bond, a new sigma bond between one of the carbons of what used to be the double bond and the heteroatom E. And so what that means is that the other carbon of what used to be the double bond now lacks two electrons, and so now it generates a carbocation. So notice that if E attaches to the carbon that had the least amount of H's, we end up forming a carbocation over here, which happens to be a primary carbocation. And generally speaking, that's not a good situation. But if the least electronegative element instead binds to the carbon with the most H's, well, what that means is that you will bind to this carbon, so the carbon on the left side will be the electron deficient carbon, meaning that your carbocation will be formed here on the left side. And if you look carefully, you realize that that carbocation is secondary. And so secondary is a much better situation than a primary carbocation. So you're going to be undergoing this reaction via formation of the second carbocation, which then will react with the freshly produced X minus species to complete the addition product. And so this is the actual mechanism for how the Markovnikov addition takes place. And as stated down here, it's all due to the formation of the most stable carbocation. To give you some concrete examples, we could start with the alkene shown right here, reacting with um, HCl, a strong acid. Now between hydrogen and chlorine, hydrogen is least electronegative, so the alkene will attack the hydrogen. The electrons of that HCl bond will go towards the chlorine, making chloride in the process, right? So we produce chloride. And notice right here that um, if the proton ends up being added to the carbon that has the least amount of H's, so this carbon right here, which has no H's bound to it, you will produce a carbocation on this particular end, which is technically a primary carbocation. So that's a no-go. But if you attach the hydrogen on the carbon that has the most H's, which is the right carbon, then on the left side, you will produce the carbocation, and here, here you actually produce a tertiary carbocation. So this is a lot better than the situation I was depicting in the uh, previous uh, generic example. So between tertiary and primary, tertiary carbocations win. So you will primarily go via this route. You'll produce this particular intermediate. And from that intermediate, the chloride will attack to complete the addition product. Now, one thing that needs to be emphasized is that because you are creating carbocations, at least with this particular uh, halogens, um, the creation of the carbocations has the potential for leading to rearrangements, hydride migrations, methyl, methyl, methylide migrations. So you have to be um, pretty much on point and very alert as to what the neighboring groups of the carbocation are because rearrangements can happen. Oh, and one more thing before I move on to the next example. If the center you're attacking once the final group attacks and attaches to that particular carbon of the carbocation, if you end up creating a center that has four different groups, then you're technically creating a chiral center. But because this is an attack on a trigonal planar carbocation, the attack can happen from the front or the back portion of that plane. And so you produce a racemic mixture of both enantiomers. All right, let's do one more example. So in this case, we have uh, the following alkene reacting with ClF between chlorine and fluorine. Chlorine is least electronegative, so we expect chlorine to attach to the carbon that has the most H's. But if you look carefully, you realize that the carbon on this alkene has one H, and the carbon on the other side of the alkene has also one H. So they both have the same number of H's. So you might think, well, we're going to produce like 50-50 amounts of both carbocations. And normally that's what will happen, but let's take a closer look. If the alkene attacks the chlorine, which is the least electronegative atom, and the fluoride you know, takes in those electrons, um, in one situation we could have the chlorine attaching to the left carbon of that alkene, producing the carbocation on the right side. 
and that's a secondary carbon. But if the chlorine attaches to the carbon on the right side of that alkene, then we will produce a carbocation here on the left side, which is also secondary. They're both secondary carbocations. So you might say, okay, it's the same picture, same idea, 50-50 amount of products. However, the carbocation on this end is right next to a multiple bond. Um, so this is what we call specifically a benzylic carbocation and because it's next to a multiple bond it can be stabilized via resonance and due to the fact that resonance can stabilize it a secondary benzylic carbocation is a lot more stable than a regular secondary carbocation so we actually expect that the secondary benzylic carbocation will be the intermediate produced to a greater extent so even though they're both secondary and they both can be produced um, because they are likely species as carbocations, um, we're expecting that we're going to produce the, the two different products, the one where the chlorine is closest to the benzene ring, the one where the chlorine is farthest from the benzene ring. But the one that has the chlorine farthest from the benzene ring arises from the secondary benzylic carbocation. So we would expect that this particular product will be the major product of the reaction. Uh, whereas the one that has the chlorine closest to the, ben the benzene ring, um, which arises from the secondary carbocation, the regular secondary carbocation, uh, will be the minor product. So these are the things that you have to keep in mind and think about when describing you know, how much of a product you're expecting to get. The major product, of course, is gonna be the species you will expect to get as a majority, um, that could be anything above 50, right? It could just be 60%, it could be 55, it could be 90%. Um, that really depends on the actual experimental setup, but you expect to have more of this product than that based on the analysis of the intermediate. All right, now on the next video, we're gonna talk about the addition of hydrogen onto alkenes. Um, so, and that's a pretty big topic, so we'll save it for the next video. So I'll see you there.